Okay, so here we are online. And as always, the people watching this right now are probably watching this later after the live stream. Um, the live stream starts in about 11 minutes. Um, but um, if you're watching this later, you will want to fast forward. Um, right now, are you going to watch me do boring things like link this all up to all the various places? So I apologize for that part of it. Um, we should take your screen off for a minute. Um, so yeah, sorry about that. I know this is boring to watch just me doing this, but uh, it's got to be done. Uh, today's class is on bird landscaping and gardening for the birds. Um, and, uh, um, and, uh, that's what we're doing tonight. <laughs> that's kind of redundant. Um, it's cause I'm multitasking. You can hear my cat in the background. He's got a very sad song. He doesn't want to, he doesn't want to be in there. Oops, come on now. There it is. Okay, that's working. And um, <laughs> cat, save that. Damber, damber, damber. Um, make sure that you, uh, let us know your questions that you're going to have. And um, also um, let me know if there's some pr any problem with the sound. You know, all the usual stuff. If you've been taking these classes, that's what we always do. We ask you to let us know if uh, something's messed up, the image or the sound, or am I not talking loud enough or whatever. Just let, let me know. <clears throat> Uh, this computer open. How's everybody doing anyway? Everybody uh, having a good week? Are you having a good spring? It's it's a spring now. Events. In the event page, where do you usually put the link? You just post it in the event, or you put it in the um, you you edit the details. Is that what you do? Where's that?
All right, that part's done. Back to this, back to that. Here is. Okay, I think I've done all the basics here. Um, I'm gonna go grab my drink and I will be back. <laughs> okay, we start class in about four minutes. Um, so, um, getting some things ready here. So, um, where are we at here? Three minutes to. So, uh, yeah, so today's class is going to be on uh, landscape, most more landscaping than gardening. I know what does gardening actually mean, but uh, we're talking about bird landscaping for the birds. Um, and so we're going to talk about uh, not only uh, plants that are really good for attracting and supporting bird life in your yard, but also about feeding birds and um, how that can be done and, um, and uh, some of the things that you might consider when you're thinking about supporting birds. It's not just about feeding them. So we'll talk about all of that. Um, but, uh, let's see here. Yeah. You know, two minutes left here and I have to remember that there is a delay so I can kind of start now, I guess. So, all right. Hi. <laughs> and action. Um, so, uh, if you need to ask a question, um, of course, um, if, if you're watching this on YouTube, there's usually a chat function in the side. Sometimes people have a hard time finding it or getting it. Sometimes it doesn't work. So if that's the case, there's a phone number down there, 520-909-3619. That is our business phone number and you can text questions to it. And I got my phone right here in case you do. Um, and of course you can also, if you have, um, oh, hey, hey, CJ. Um, yeah, I, yeah, it's beautiful weather right now for sure. Um, 
so uh, anyway, you can, uh, that's our, um, if you forget the number 520-909-3619, then just look us up on Google and the number that's on Google is the number you can text. So let's just start off with a little bit of uh, a cat. <laughs> Um, I'm going to full screen here, um, hopefully. Um, so, um, first of all, I just wanted to talk about some of the books that, uh, that goes along with this subject. Um, and, uh, there's a number of them, um, but, uh, and well, there's a ton of bird books out there, right? And there's a ton of local bird books out there. Um, um, so, um, the best on the subject, see, there's, there is no real general, um, sorry, I'm just switching cords and stuff here. Um, there is no real um, bird gardening book that I know of that's specifically for this region, except for this one, but it's a specific group of birds. Uh, and we sell this book. Um, so Marcy Scott's Hummingbird Plants of the Southwest. This is also a great plant book because she put in some really cool plants in here um, that are not commonly available. And, um, and uh, sorry, juggling with stuff here. Um, I don't know what this computer is doing. Um, anyway, there's, there's plants in here that are not commonly in the trade. Um, so don't get your hopes up about all these plants in here, but, you know, beautiful pictures, um, and not just the regular old, it's not just Penstemon, you know, Perry eye, like, like she talks about some, some very cool native plants and, and her, her area that she's working with is the same general area that, uh, um, um, that we work with, which is the Southwest U.S. and Mexico. So, um, so there's some Chihuahuan native plants in there, and there's there's some uh, Sonoran plants, and of course a lot of Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Southern California. So great book. Um, again, we sell this. So if you uh, so it, and it's autographed. <laughs> I never really care about that um, unless I actually know them. But um, but uh, the ones we're selling are autographed. And um, like I said, this is a very good plant book too. It's a, it's a great native plant book. And there's a lot of plants that are in here that are not in a lot of other books or not in any other books. So highly recommended. Um, then there's just like, um, there's, so really what you're doing when you're bird gardening is, is you're learning natural history, you know? And so um, um, that's another thing to, to, to consider too, when you're, when you're thinking about all, all of this. Um, and, uh, sorry, I'm having a problem with this computer. Um, it's just the computer where, oh, there we go. Okay. So, um, so anyway, uh, natural history, um, this is a book that everyone who lives in this area should have. This is the Sonoran Desert, A Natural History of the Sonoran Desert. And it is a fantastic book. Um, and that's what you're really doing when you're doing bird gardening, you are um, learning natural history. You're learning what the birds, you're not just learning about how to identify a bird. You're learning what do they eat and what time of year are they um, nesting? And um, what do they use to build their nests? Um, you know, all that sort of thing. So, um, so learning natural history is going to make you a better wildlife gardener in general. Um, so, so that's, that's a good book. And then of course, um, reading there's, I have too many of these books to show you all of them, but, but there's a lot of local writers who write about birds and they write about their natural history. And if you really want to learn about, you know, if you want to be more than just a, 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 a you know, a counter, um, what do they call it? Um, uh, when bird, you know, if there's birders out there, a lister, you, you, if you're just, if you're going to be a lister, you probably won't care about this as much. But those of you who are into the birds more than just ticking them off on your list and you want to learn more about them, um, then, um, then, you know, read, read local books. Um, and they're going to, they're going to give you really good information about the, what they're doing 
throughout the year? What do they live on? All that. There's several of them. Um, hit up Tucson Audubon Society's uh, bookshop. Um, that's a great local source to get them from and you're supporting the Audubon Society. So I highly recommend you do that. Um, there's, you know, the old Bibles too, the Sibley guides. Um, this is, this is not just the guide to identify them, but bird life and behavior. So it's the natural history of these birds. And when I say natural history of, I mean, like their life, you know, their, their life story, what are they eating? When do they nest? How do they mate? Um, do, do they migrate? When do they come here? You know, all that stuff. Um, there is of course, just learning um, where the birds are. And so, you know, there's several of these books too. Um, um, and we've got them all in our house because we're nuts about this kind of stuff. So th this this will help you uh, go to some of the hot spots around Southeast Arizona and, and find some of these birds. But this, this class isn't about birding necessarily, it's about bird gardening. Um, there's also, you know, little books like this. Um, this is a Southwest nature fact book and they cover birds in here as well as mammals and reptiles and plants and stuff. So this is a, a great little book. Um, a national book um, that some of you may have seen the author speak of. I think he came to Tucson not that long ago, um, but uh, Nature's Best Hope. And this is all about backyard wildlife gardening. And for a lot of you who have been with us for a while, some of this might be basic, but there's some good information in here. And um, you just have to always, you know, when it's not a locally produced book, then you always have to translate it for what does it mean for here? And especially with our, um, with our climate. Someone says, show, can you show the second book cover again? I don't know what the second one was. <laughs> uh, was it this one? That was the first one, right? Yeah, I think that was the first one. Second book, was it um, the natural history of the Sonoran Desert? Is that the one you were talking about? Um, there's that one. Okay, um, sorry, someone was just asking me. Um, and of course there was, there was this one. I don't know which one was number two, but um, those, are, those are some good books. So on, onward. Um, tonight I'm drinking a, a wine out of a can, uh, but it's Dos Cabezas, which is in Senoida. Um, they do a really great job. This is called Pink Wine 2019 Carbonated. Um, so it's a wine in a can and uh, um, it's delicious. So it's carbonated too. It's like a, it's like a effer, effervescent um, rosé. So cheers, everybody. Cheers to, to wildlife. All right, let's get to the class. And thank you for being patient um, with all this juggling with technology. Um, <clears throat> so, um, the basic class agenda, we're going to go over some general guidelines for bird gardening. We're going to discuss different types of birds and how to support them in your yard. Um, we're going to talk about feeding birds, um, and then we're going to talk about plant, uh, uh, plant profiles of um, plants that support birds. So uh, let's move on. Now, first of all, I think everybody should look into joining the Habitat at Home um, efforts by Tucson Audubon Society. Support Tucson Audubon Society. They're great. They're doing really great work. One of the, my favorite programs of theirs is basically everything that we do. Um, we, 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 they have a giant checklist of things that you can do to um, support um, wildlife in your backyard. Um, it's you know, with a bird emphasis, but not just birds. And um, you can get this little sign. We got one at the nursery. Um, um, where, um, you know, you reach certain goals and uh, they have a little sticker you can add on there um, to see, you know, how far you've gotten along in your efforts to making your habitat at home um, or making your yard friendly for wildlife. So we've done this class before um, on a broader subject though. Last time we did this class, it was on wildlife gardening, but we're emphasizing the birds for this class. Um, but I highly recommend you check out Habitat at Home. It's a really cool program. Um, they have really good advice. Um, and uh, so, um, so do that, okay? Um, obviously, 
um, I don't know why I always feel like I need to say this, but we, uh, we should always be pesticide free. Um, it's super important. And, uh, you know, I'll give you just one example of something that some people take uh, exception for, and then you, then you realize the mistake you've made. So um, pack rats are really annoying for certain people. And um, there's a lot of <laughs> companies who say they've got these, um, you know, ways of getting rid of them. And um, some of them even say, even though they're using poison, that, they, that, the, that their traps work and protect um, wildlife. And what I mean is, uh, if you poison a pack rat, um, the things that eat the pack rats will be poisoned. And it's a, there's terrible videos online of owls dying from pesticide poisoning because they ate the rat. And so please no, please don't, po don't poison your pests. Find other ways of capturing them. You know, use have a heart traps, or if you don't, you know, care about catching them live, use traps, but don't poison them. And um, even the little traps that they say, those little traps that the, the, the rats go in and supposedly don't come out, they don't work. I've seen them not work. So don't use those um, because those, 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 those uh, rodents can get out of those traps. And, um, and if something eats them, then they're doomed. And also uh, a lot of animals can go into those traps and get those critters too, like a snake or whatever. So, um, don't use pesticides at all. Just don't do it. Don't don't um, use poison. Stay away from that stuff. It should be a given. Um, another thing to think about is um, domestic cats, and even if you don't have your own cats, but if you do have your own cats, try to try to keep them inside and try to try to set up the yard. If if you have them outside, try to set up the yard that they can't get to them. Um, be very mindful that your cats can go after the birds you're trying to attract. Um, but it is best to keep them inside. We're building a whole catio just to, to address this problem in our house because, um, um, you know, we don't want our cats killing birds. So, um, you know, we're going pretty far out of our way to, to, to stop that from happening. But even if you don't, even if you don't have cats, there are feral cats in people's neighborhoods. So when you set up everything, you should set up things such that um, that you, you give protective places for little birds to hang out. Where you put the food, if you're feeding birds, make sure there's lots of space around it so that if a cat does approach the bird feeders, um, that the birds see it in time to fly away. Don't, don't hide a shrub right next to it that a cat can leap out of and go after the birds um, feeding on on the bird seed or, or keep them high enough so that the birds, so that, you know, the cats can't get to them. But think about this, this is an issue. Um, and um, it's, it's just something to, to, to pay a lot of attention to. Sorry, so I am gonna try to um, uh, keep up with questions. Oh, someone asked, how do we send you money for the class? It's not, um, you don't have to do that, but, but uh, if you do want to uh, on our website, go to the online classes button and then there's like three different ways to pay. You can Venmo us, um, you can do it through our online store, and I think the other one's PayPal. So that is on our, um, on our online store, I'm sorry, on our online classes button on our webpage. Um, and someone screamed Catio. Um, we're excited about that too. We also love that Desert Museum book. It's pretty incredible. They include geology. So anyway, sorry about the late, question thing. Um, <clears throat> obviously, plant native plants. Um, remember that the plants that, that are native here are the ones who evolved with the birds that fly through our area. And I'll give you an, a, good, a good example of what, um, of, of, um, of a plant that, that fits into this category, um, the mesquite. So um, on the um, in, in the nurseries right now, you can buy a Chilean mesquite, you can buy the thornless South American mesquite, you can buy, um, uh, you know, uh, various um, species of mesquites. The important thing for birds that have, that have um, evolved in this area and migrate here at a certain time of year is the timing of our, na our native velvet mesquite. When the, if you notice the native velvet mesquite kind of um, 
uh, it's dormant a little longer than the Chilean mesquite. And it's just different in general, like the, they don't have the, the, the Chilean mesquites and the South American mesquites don't have as many of those, what they call extra floral nectaries. There, there are nectar glands around the plant that release nectar and that attracts insects and all kinds of insects. And they're not bad for the plant. The plant obviously is doing this for a reason too. Um, and I don't know all the reasons actually why the, the mesquite has, has evolved to have this, but when, they, when, those, when those leaves first break, there's all this activity happening. So there's a lot of insects and who comes here at that exact time of year is the Lucy's warbler. And that Lucy's warbler very much depends on the native mesquite. When we plant non-native mesquites, we're not giving, we're not providing that same sort of habitat that it, that the Lucy's warbler depends on. But what's even worse is that the mesquites hybridize so readily because um, their 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 flowers are um, bee pollinated, especially native bees, and um, and those bees get around and they they um, you know they'll they'll be pollinating a, a Chilean mesquite and then they go over to the native mesquite and they pollinate that and then the seeds of those plants will produce hybrids and um, in fact for us like we have to ensure that the native mesquites that we sell um, that the seed has been collected from far away from people um, where there's just velvet mesquites and, and we know there's no um, non-native mesquites that are going to hybridize with those mesquites um, so it's important too, if you're planting a native mesquite and it's for the Lucy's warbler or, or birds in general, um, make sure that the people selling the velvet mesquite, that they know where that um, came from, where that seed came from. Most of them won't, or they'll pretend, some of them will even pretend like they know, but uh, you know, ensure that you're actually planting a true native mesquite. So anyway, plant native plants, it's important. Um, there's plants that we that birds use for shelter. This is a quail bush. Um, quail bushes grow really, really wide. So if you don't have a lot of space in your yard, you might want to stay away from this plant, but uh, uh, or you'll have to trim it back a lot. But they get really wide. One plant can get, I, I mean, I've seen them 20 feet wide. Like they're just incredible. They're usually like 10 feet wide, but they can get really big. And I think they reroot too as they're spreading out but um, obviously a lot of birds hang out in there um, but of course uh, the better shelter plants are the ones that are kind of spiny like this um, wolfberry in this picture um, wolfberries and desert hackberries and gray thorn are uh, plants that uh, that are spinescent they um, they're not actually they don't actually have thorns per se their their branches end in points so it's a really pointy shrub and it's really hard, definitely hard for a cat to get into and, and mess with your birds. Um, so they have a lot of, um, you know, protection in those kinds of plants. So big shrubby thorny shrubs are, are great. Um, and obviously trees, like we've already mentioned the velvet mesquite that's on the right there, but on the left there you see a sycamore. Not, not everyone in, who's watching this may have um, the time for I'm sorry, not the time, the space for a sycamore. Um, the sycamores get very big and they also need a lot of water. They're riparian. However, big trees like that attract certain birds. Um, particularly birds of prey really like these really tall plants. And if you don't have a, a sycamore, you know, some of these other, there's a few non-native plants that are actually really good for these birds of prey, like eucalyptus and um, the old Aleppo pines that might already be in your neighborhood or in your own yard. Um, they're actually really good trees for nesting, especially for those big birds. The bigger the birds, usually like the higher up they seem to want to be. I mean, that's not always the case, but it is a case for a lot of birds. So anyway, trees obviously are really good shelter plants and especially if they're native. Um, cactus particularly choyas um, and prickly pears too, um, are incredible habitat plants. There's some birds that that's their favorite nesting sp sp you know, place. And it's crazy because like, you know, we even come close to these things and they stick to us. I don't know, you know, it's, it's I don't know how those birds like the Gila woodpecker just hop around and they're like nothing. Um, or the cactus wren, it, cactus wren is called the cactus wren because it, they can just hop around in choyas and they build nests in choyas and, and uh, um, they're obviously protected. So, um, so another, another plant to think about. Um, 
um, someone messaged me a couple of days ago and reminded me of a, of a very good point about pruning plants. This isn't saying don't prune plants at all. Although if you're wildlife gardening, you, you probably don't need to prune your trees very much at all, unless there's something like super in your way. But, um, but the, um, but the really important thing is don't prune your plants in spring. And I know it's the opposite of what they tell you. Um, they always say, you know, it's the best to plant your, you know, do pruning in late winter, early spring here. But there's a reason you don't want to do that. And that's these guys. Um, well, not, and not just hummingbirds, but hummingbirds especially because they have tiny little nests and they're easy to miss and they're out in the, the tips of these, these branches. Um, so, you know, if you can avoid pruning trees at all, that's probably the best thing. And same with large shrubs, like plants that birds nest in, just avoid pruning them in the spring if you can, because, um, you know, the, the guys who do this for a living, they see this all the time and they're forced to do it because that's their job. They have to prune trees, but it's probably a huge bummer for them to deal with this all the time because they prune trees and then they, there, there goes that bird nest and, and uh, you know, lots of other things happening in the canopies too. There's wasps nests and, and other things that are up in those canopies where we want them, right? We don't want to be near wasps. We want them to have their own little space, even though most of them don't sting, but that's another thing. Um, it, it, just avoid pruning in the spring. Um, and if you can avoid pruning totally, you know, that's better. Because wildlife gardening, the whole underlying theme here is, that we're doing it for them, we're not doing it for us. And that is sort of how we look at our yard. I mean, we have our garden where we grow our vegetables and fruits and stuff um, and herbs or whatever. Um, but you know, most of our yard is devoted to, to wildlife and, um, and that's what we want. We want everything we do, we do for them. So that, that means you might need to change some of your, um, your perceptions about what a good looking landscape looks like too, because um, some, some wildlife gardens that are the best for birds are, you know, not so um, attractive to people who really like things, you know, but I always say like, uh, you know, as the meme, I don't know if you've seen us share this meme before, but do you still wear Victorian clothing? Um, you know, you don't have to garden like you're still in Victorian times. And I swear to God, people have these yards that are just like everything's pruned and, you know, it looks like it looks like something out of another century. And it's like, why are we still gardening that way? That's, it's ugly. <laughs> it doesn't look good. Um, anyway, and, and it's also like learning to garden with the region in mind too, because a lot of those techniques in gardening come from colonialism and they come from another entirely different continent and we don't need to do what they did in England we can do our own thing and have our own look and and especially in Arizona where our plants are so cool like why why try to make things look like they're from somewhere else <clears throat> think you know here's another thing you know if you got palms and you know if you've watched me in these classes before that I'm a big fan of the palm tree um and um and they're really good wildlife plants, especially when you leave those skirts on. They call that a skirt. That's the old leaves that have bent down and turned brown. And honestly, I think it looks better than those bald trunks that they're skinny and go all the way up. I think this looks cool and shaggy and they look like Muppets. Um, but what's cooler is birds nest in there. And not, not only do birds nest in there, bats, native bats nest in there too. And some, in fact, some very rare bats. So, um, so, you know, change how you, how you view um, landscaping and, and try to not do what everyone's been doing for a long time. Because honestly, a lot of what people have been doing is not necessarily good for the plants. It's just for our weird aesthetic thing that we always have to um, impose on our, on our landscapes. Um, think about nesting materials. So a lot of plants produce material that birds and bees, actually native bees, used to build nests. Um, a lot of the floof um, that some people find annoying, like on the desert broom, that is a great nesting material for, for birds. Um, and uh, down on the lower right hand corner, that is the floof after um, the um, cerium has been blooming. Cerium or um, Katie, 
Circium thistle. thistle. Yeah, milk thistle. Thank you. Um, milk thistle um, or th any of the thistles, they have that floof afterwards. Um, and then on the right hand side there, there's uh, um, the, the Arizona cotton top, which has a floofy bloom and, uh, and a close up of what the seed looks like when it's um, pulled off the plant. Anyway, a lot of the, there's a lot of plants that provide nesting material, but you can usually kind of tell. Also, you know, bark um, on a lot of trees that comes off easily that, you know, that kind of sheds easily um, is used by especially hummingbirds, but other birds too um, for, for nesting material. Um, so uh, think about that when you're planting too. Um, it's not, you, you know, you often think about the habitat that birds are going to live in, but sometimes you don't think about the materials they use. And, and that includes um, spiders, leaving the spiders in your yard. Now, of course, leaving spiders in your yard is a good thing to do anyway, but we have some spider webs on our bedroom window that uh, almost every day there's a hummingbird coming by and, and, and taking up that uh, um, silk from the web and using it to, to build its nest. Hummingbirds in particular love using spider webs. Um, so uh, that's another, another reason of the many reasons to love spiders. Um, sorry if you have um, a phobia of the critter, but, um, but it is a, is, a, is a cool animal. <clears throat> and then providing a source of water is, is always a good idea. Um, and, uh, you know, whether it's uh, just a bird, uh, a, a water feature like this, like a bird um, bath, or uh, actually having a, a, an actual water feature, like an aquaponics system or a pond in your yard. But, um, and, and that draws it in its own birds. But, uh, you know, all birds need water and they all end up using it, including obviously owls. Um, but, uh, you know, um, hummingbirds, um, you know, sparrows, cardinals, everybody go, comes to the water. And you don't have to worry about the bees. Bees will be on it too, but um, the birds are not as afraid of bees as you are. Um, so you don't have to worry for the birds. They know how to get around those, uh, uh, those bees. <clears throat> so now we're gonna think about um, birds in, in, in terms of categories of what they eat. And this is gonna help us um, understand uh, what plants or plant or bird food to use to attract certain types of birds. And, um, and, you know, if you meet all these food needs, then you will have a diverse uh, amount of species coming through your yard, which is what probably most of us want. Um, so obviously there are fruit eating birds, um, you know, uh, the woodpeckers are famous for, for loving fruits. Um, also the phenopepla, that little blackbird that kind of looks like a cardinal with the, with the tuft on the head, but you know, like a miniature cardinal, but it's, you know, black. Um, the females are silver. Um, they specifically eat um, mistletoe, um, which is, of course, if you're fans of us or have been watching us for a while, uh, mistletoe is, is uh, not harmful to trees, um, you know, to healthy trees anyway. And so if you're taking care of your tree, you can handle having some mistletoe. Um, and and uh, you know they they pull in not just uh, birds like phenopepla, but uh, you know the the purple hair streak, which is one of the most beautiful butterflies, uses it as a larval food plant. So um, so don't be afraid of mistletoe; it's a great fruiting plant. But anyway, we have fruit eating birds. We have the 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 granivorous birds. That means seed eating um, grain evorous. So. Um, the seed eating birds, we got to think about, we got to think about the nectar feeders, which is not something that usually gets forgotten. I think people are pretty obsessed with hummingbirds, but, uh, um, but there's other uh, nectar feeding birds besides hummingbirds, and we'll talk about that. Um, canopy gleaners are birds like the Lucy's warbler. They glean the canopy for insects, and, uh, and uh, they only nibble on other things too, but um, but uh, they're really after the insects, um, and they're, you know, a verdin is a canopy gleaner too, although verdins are also um, nectar feeders. So not all these birds fit only in one of these categories. A lot of birds use more than one type of food. A lot of birds that are nectar feeders are also insectivorous too. Um, so like hummingbirds um, eat a lot of insects. If you ever wondered like on those dry years when there's nothing flowering, but you see hummingbirds around, that's probably how they're getting by. Um, is, is uh, you know, eating a lot of little gnats and stuff. Um, then there's the ground gleaners, the, like this Abert's towhee. 
Um, <clears throat> in our yard, we, uh, we put down that wood chip mulch in, everywhere. And, uh, and underneath the wood chip mulch starts to develop a lot of decomposing insects sh show up and they're, they're down there um, decomposing things as they do. And, um, and uh, when we added in that um, wood chip mulch, we noticed a whole host of birds that showed up and offhand that I can think about is the Abert's toey showed up in our yard at that point. And so did the Baywick's wren, um, which we knew was in the area, but never showed up in our yard. And now they're in the yard all the time. and can't get rid of them. So, um, and, and so we've seen a lot of birds uh, that are ground gleaners just because we added that wood chip mulch. So a wood chip mulch, really great. Um, also just leaving compost, you know, having a compost pile um, pleases those ground gleaners. And, um, and, uh, and also having, you know, organic material, you know, develop and fall to the ground and leave it alone. It's good for the plants anyway, but it's, the birds love it. Another reason to do that. Um, and then there's, you know, birds that feed on the wing, like the flycatchers, um, who will, um, you know, in our yard, the flycatchers actually hang out near the compost pile and they swoop over it because there's little gnats and sometimes flies, but it, but they're it seemed to really like is those little, I think it's actually a wasp. Um, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny wasp, um, doesn't sting. And you if you saw it, you wouldn't call it a wasp, but that's, I think, what it is. And the, the flycatcher and uh, the uh mat catcher they they hang out in front of the um uh compost pile and they swoop around and and get those uh, insects and then of course carnivorous birds right um don't get upset you know you'll <laughs> once in a while those birds you're feeding at the at the seed hopper um may succumb to you know a cooper's uh, hawk or a red tail or something so um, or an owl. So, you know, that's all part of it, right? We, we, we love all these birds. And then, you know, if you're super, um, uh, if you're superstar bird gardener, you can even attract some of these aquatic birds if you're able to add in a, uh, you know, a water feature. Um, so, and by the way, they will eat your fish. <laughs> um, and we, we invite that. So like, um, you know, we'll, if we have goldfish and stuff like that, like we've, we've had them disappear. And I, I presume that we've had like a blue herring or something like that come in and, and clean us out a little bit. Um, at the nursery, we're not that far from Reed Park. And, um, and there they have this, you know, they have, you know, the various um, of the uh, herons and uh, the green, I think the night heron and, and the, um, um, and the blue heron. Um, someone asked, how can we deal with a lot of ants in the yard? I don't want to poison them, but they eat the leaves and the trees and the plants. Well, first of all, the uh, plants do come back from a feeding from ants, but it is annoying. Um, there's not much you can really do about it, but, um, you know, uh, obviously if there's lizards around, especially horny toads, they love ants. And there's a lot of, you know, there are birds that will eat them too. Um, and lizards. So, you know, making your lizards happy will help. The one thing I can say, if you don't want to poison them, um, ants, and, and, you know, sometimes you don't want them like on your patio and they're all over your patio, right? Um, if they're out in your yard and they're defoliating some plants sometimes, even though it's really annoying, I would, su I would suggest to leave them alone if you can. But if you really have to get rid of them, um, you never can really get rid of them, but what you can do is get them to exit out of a different hole. Now, ant nests are giant. They're bigger than your yard. So they, they can exit out of other holes that end up in your back alley or your neighbor's yard. So what you can do is harass them and it takes persistence. Um, you have to keep doing it, but pack down, you know, wherever they're coming out of, you find their hole, pack it down with mud um, or flood it, like just stick a hose in there and flood it. Um, and then pack it with mud and just keep harassing them. Just keep, you know, closing up their holes anytime they, they um, try to come out. You know, if you, got, if you can find some really clay-like mud and just slap it over that hole and then maybe put a rock on top of that. And they'll get out of, they'll find their way through that. They're persistent too. But if you keep doing that, eventually what they do is like, hey, this is not the best exit for us. 
let's do another exit and, and then it ends up in another spot that's that's either in your neighbor's yard or just in a, in a distant part of the yard that you don't care about as much or the, or the alley. Um, so I find that that is the best way to, to deal with ants. Um, the poisons that are out there are, um, are bad. And not only because they, well, all pesticides are, as we've spoken about, you're going to poison your lizards eating the ants. You're going to, you're going to poison um, a lot of things. They always say that, oh, it only gets the ants, but that's not true. It, it's just not true. Um, but the other problem with it is bees uh, are, have the same kind of attitude that ants do. So bees pick up that same uh, bait and you're hurting bees when you, uh, the, the, um, the honeybees, even though they're not native, they're important. Um, you know, so don't do that, but harass them. That's what we do. Anyway, on to the next slide. So feeding birds is okay. And, and a lot of people will ask this question, like, well, shouldn't we always try to do native plants as much as possible? Yes, as much as you can but feeding them is also a good thing to do. And why, why, why that instead of going all natural? Um, well, not instead, but why that in addition to going all natural? Why doesn't all natural work? Well, habitat, there's not a lot of habitat out there. And where do we live? Most of us live in some kind of urban area. Um, but even if you live in, in, uh, out in Cochise County, you're in an agriculture area. And those areas um, have had a lot, a lot of habitat loss. So the habitat loss means food loss. And it also means, you know, um, shelter loss and a bunch of other things too. So what you want to do is try to do the best you can in your own little backyard and, and concentrate an area where there's food to make up for the fact that there's all this disturbance all around us where there is no food. So, um, so feeding birds is okay. And it's better than okay. It's a really good thing to do. So um, let's talk about feeding birds. Um, some guidelines that you should um, follow. Um, the food should be fresh, okay? So particularly with bird seed, there's a lot of cheap stuff out there um, and has fillers too, which is another guideline here. Like don't um, pick, and, and, and what is fillers? We're gonna talk about that in detail, but in general, uh, that red milo, which is basically sorghum, and wheat um, are some of the things, or, or whole col corn kernels they stick in there. Um, there's stuff that they put in there that's just filler and, and nobody eats it. Um, and so buy a better quality um, bird food. And we're going to talk about that. Um, and and uh, don't, uh, don't buy any bird seed from a pesticide company. And I'm saying this specifically because I, th I think it was Scott's that made some kind of bird food that killed a bunch of birds. Um, it's because they're, they're pesticide people. They're not bird food people. Don't buy a product from one company that does something else like that. Like don't buy miracle Grow bird food or Scott's or any of those like giant chain, you know, and don't buy them out of the dollar store. Um, you know, I know that we are all trying to save a dime, but, um, but you know, some of that stuff is crap and some of it's bad for them. So um, don't do it. Um, the, the food should not have any dyes. And what I'm talking about that is, of course, hummingbird food shouldn't be red. Um, the, um, and, and also know that different types of foods attract different types of birds. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that. And this location of your bird, uh, bird food should be in a safe place. And again, like I said, don't put a, a, a shrub that a cat can hang out in right next to where the birds are eating. Um, especially if you have it low to the ground, like a quail block, you know, those blocks that they feed quail on, you put on the ground. Um, if you can suspend that, uh, that'd be great for the doves will still use it. But if you're really trying to feed those ground birds like quail, um, make sure there's lots of space around that quail block. So if a cat comes by, they can, you know, get out of there. Um, so, and then having water nearby helps birds eat. So um, having a, you know, a bird bath is, and keep it full of clean water. Oh, clean your, clean your damn bird feeders, all of them. Um, some of them you need to clean more often. The hummingbird feeders, you need to clean every day in the summer. Um, you really should. Um, I know that sounds like a pain in the butt, but you should do it. And if you love the hummingbirds, you'll do it. Um, buy easy to clean hummingbird feeders. Don't buy the giant ones that, you know, are three gallon, you know, whatever. Um, what if the birds aren't using the food? Sometimes people will, will uh, put some bird food out and, um, and they, uh, nothing's happening. Well, sometimes it takes a while for the birds to see that it's there. 
sometimes it takes them a while for them to trust the food. Um, and we've had this even when we have fed the birds and then we stopped for a while and then we put some finch socks back up and it took a while and then finally finch is fine and then they're all over it. So, um, so that's usually what's going on. And there are seasons where the, the bird feeders will be way busier than other times of year. So, um, so there's, that's going on, there's that going on too. But just uh, realize that um, it does take a moment um, for them to, to, to know and trust a food source. Um, don't feed bread to birds. Um, it's really not good for them. Um, people do it all the time, particularly like um, people go to reed park ponds over there. And I know they're trying to be really nice and feed the birds, but especially those wild birds, little, you know, sparrows and stuff like, you know, they're, they're city urban birds and they, they live off of junk and that's just kind of how they are. But those, uh, you're actually kind of causing problems for some of those other birds, those nutritional problems. They really need um, high protein foods, not this empty calories. So, um, so don't feed bread to birds. Um, it's not good for them. Okay. So maybe you can find some um, bird seed that you can take to Reed Park instead. And, uh, um, and feed those birds. Okay, so the nectar station. Um, this uh, obviously is what a lot of people think about. Um, this is obviously a, a big, um, a big hummingbird feeder. Now, how big your hummingbird feeder should be, um, you know, close to uh, how many birds you're feeding and how quickly it empties. Like I said, in the summertime, you're going to want to clean that thing every day or at least every other day because um, molds develop that can really harm them. Um, but you know, some of you have enough birds come into your yard that they empty this out, especially if some of these other nectar feeders are using it. Um, and so um, clean them daily if you can. And these little flat saucer type uh, bird feeders are easier to clean. You just need that little brush for the little hole and that's the hardest part. The, um, the other part is it easily comes apart and you can, you know, get in there. With these, with these types of bird feeders with the tops, you know, sometimes you can't fit your hand in there, so you'll need a brush. Um, anyway, just be as thorough as you can and clean them. Um, the, you know, the nectar uh, station is going to be visited by the verdin um, or the Gila woodpecker or, uh, or woodpeckers in general or orioles when they're coming through, which is cool that it's always fun to see orioles. They, they're not common in our yard, but when they, when they're coming through, it's always a sight. And then at night in the, in the warm season, you have bats and they'll clean you out. Sometimes you're like, wow, where's my hummingbird food going? Um, and sometimes people blame the bees or whatever. It's probably bats. Like at night, they, they come and get nectar. And that's cool, right? Um, you know, because we're, you know, bats are, they're not birds, but uh, they're honorary birds and we love bats. So, um, so it's good that we're feeding them. But again, keep, them, keep these stations clean. Don't use this stuff. Um, just don't. And if you see someone using it, tell them, hey, that stuff's really bad for the hummingbird. Um, th these are some acceptable, you can just use um, pure cane sugar. I think it's one to four, um, you know, one part uh, uh, sugar to four parts water. Katie? Katie? Um, the mix for the um, hummingbird market or sugar, is it one to four, one part water, four parts? I mean, is it one part water, four parts sugar, or the other way around? No. Four parts water, one part sugar. Yeah, that's what I thought. I'm just double checking. <laughs> I'm having a senior moment. Um, all right, so you can use regular sugar, and that's fine. Um, we think it's nicer to mimic nature. Um, now, this the humming the hummingbird market stuff. The the guy that makes this stuff has taken a hard look at flowers and the types of sugars that are in there because there's other things besides sucrose there's glucose there's 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 many different types of sugars and so he's he takes uh he he has the uh, a ratio of sugars of different types of sugars that mimic what what flowers these um native um hummingbirds are using and so that's what that's all about that's what that stuff is um, it, it, there's been some discussion about it. The Audubon Society says you don't need to use that stuff. And, and, you know, because regular sugar is fine, 
Um, somebody said uh, one fourth cup of cane sugar to one cup of water. Yeah, four to one. Um, so um, so um, basically, uh, you know, regular sugar is not a bad thing. And the Audubon Society really wanted to make sure that people didn't feel outpriced that they couldn't afford to feed hummingbirds. And that's why they're really, you know, they say, hey, use sugar because it is fine. Um, we do think it's nicer to mimic nature as much as you can. Obviously plants are the best source. Um, when you can't do plants, if you can afford the hummingbird market stuff, that's great. Um, and, uh, and, if, and if, but if not, you know, sugar's just fine. Um, so <laughs> don't be a ding dong. I know it's so cool to have animals so close to you. You see this every time, I see it every time I go to the desert museum where people hold up flowers and uh, those birds, well, I mean, those birds are different because they're really zoo birds and they're in a cage, but don't, you know, don't mess with wildlife. Like don't, you're not Grizzly Adams, okay? Um, <laughs> just, I know it's cool, but just don't, try not to do this. You know, when you're feeding the birds, um, feed them, um, feed them uh, in a way that's not making them imprinted by humans. Because in the long run, you're going to hurt the animal. In the long run, you're making these animals trust humans, and not all humans should be trusted. So, um, so just avoid doing this if you can. I think you guys all know this, and even people who do this probably in the back of their minds know, like this isn't really the right thing to do. Um, but uh, um, yeah, just don't do that. Somebody asked, how frequently should we be cleaning the hummingbird feeder at this time of year? That's a good question. And I don't really, uh, I just clean it like, you know, maybe once or twice a week, I guess. I don't know. I mean, pay, pay close attention to how quickly the molds are developing. Right now it's cool at night and, um, you know, it's warm during the day. Um, but think about your water bottle, right? Um, if, if those, of, those of us who have paid attention, you know how quickly mold can develop in your water bottle? It's kind of gross. Um, you know, if you take a look inside your water bottle or in the cap, like there's mold. Um, and, and, you know, it, it can develop in a couple of days, especially if you're like putting in electrolytes, you know, on your, in your water or in the case of these guys, it's sugar. So um, maybe like once or twice a week, but, but really actually, don't listen to how many times I'm telling you, watch your feeder and see if there's mold developing. That's really what you should pay attention to. Um, so um, anyway, um, sorry, I'm just checking everything here. Okay, so um, seed eating birds, let's talk about them for a minute. There's a lot of them, right? Um, this is uh, a lot of birds that come to our yard are looking for seeds to eat. Um, let's talk about that. So there's many different types of seeds that are in food, right? And there is a few different types of feeders. Um, this is just a, this is, list isn't even a local one, but we have a lot of the same birds. Um, and, um, and, you know, you don't have to memorize this kind of thing. This just kind of gives you an idea of, of the fact that different types of birds, um, diff different types of birds uh, are attracted to certain types of seed. Um, and you can see there's red Milo there. Um, and uh, um, and uh, red Milo is sorghum. And you can see like it's the least preferred. It's like all threes, which is, you know, uh, they really do just leave it. And you know what happens is it germinates and you have sorghum coming up in your yard, which, you know, whatever. But um, it, it could be kind of weedy. So like, uh, so that's something, you know, you might want to um, not emphasize in your mix. Um, but you know we're not we're not going to go through um, all this right now and you know what kind of birds like which kind of seed. But I just want you to know that there's different preferences, so um, you can easily look this kind of stuff up online. And actually, we have a bird. Um, I will put this chart on our uh, on our bird article. We have a bird article on the plant info page, um, and there's a lot of information in there. Um, all the stuff, same stuff we're kind of going through right now, to be honest. Um, but I'll put this in there. Um, but anyway, um, there's, there's basically three types of feeders. So there's a platform feeder that, and they don't always have that little roof on them, but, uh, uh, but there's platform feeders and there's hoppers. Hoppers are usually, um, they open up at the bottom and all the food comes through, you, you fill it up at the top and then, and it, and it feeds down at the bottom there. I've noticed the Cardinals really like that. Um, 
Whereas like the, you know, the finches and, and sparrows tend to eat in the platform feeders and the, a little bit of everybody eats out of the tube feeders. So, um, so, you know, those are the three basic types of feeders. And, you know, if you're making a station at your house, maybe, maybe put all three in, um, you know, to, if you're trying to increase in amount of birds that you're, that you're the species that you're trying to attract. Um, then there's seed blocks, of course. And like I said, uh, you know, this, this is especially helpful for quail, although doves and a lot of birds will actually go down in the seed block um, because, the, you know, the quails and the doves will knock off the seeds and then other birds like sparrows, especially will come in and, and pick up the stuff that fell off. Um, but uh, you know, this seed block seen better days. Um, it's, it's, it's being used, I guess that's what it's for. Um, but yeah, seed blocks, make sure there's lots of space around them so that, you know, cats can't sneak up on these, on these birds. Um, oh yeah. And the seed blocks are usually like a mixture of, I think it's like cracked corn and there's, um, there's some kind of sugar that binds it all together, which is, is fine for them. And, uh, and a mixture of seed, I think millet, I'm not sure all of what's in there. Um, let's talk about sunflower seeds for a minute. The best sunflower seeds are the black oil sunflower seeds. Those are the ones that the birds really like. There's an exception that we'll talk about after this. There's actually one that's even more prized than the black oil seeds, but it depends on the bird. But um, there's also sunflower chips that are cheaper. Um, and the white striped sunflower seeds that are not as prized um, by birds, but, um, but they, they do eat them. Um, but really, if you're if you have a choice between these three, you get the black oil sunflower seeds. But if you're going after them goldfinches, uh, you want the Niger seed. Um, now, this is actually a sunflower um, from Africa, and it's usually heat treated so that they don't germinate here. So we don't have problems with the, an introduced species, um, you know, but um, it's really good bird food. And if you want finches, Get a finch sock and get some Niger seed, the gold finches in particular, what I'm talking about. Um, and they will be all over it. And like I said, that sock might hang there. And sometimes it hangs there for a week or two even. You know, it, it, sometimes if you're out of the way, and you're not in their pathway, they don't see it. Um, you know, it might take a while for them to find it. Once they find it, they'll be all over it all the time and they'll be emptying it out. <clears throat> and they beat those socks up too. Yeah, and you got to you got to um, replace those socks every once in a while because they uh, um, they beat them up to where they, they get really leaky. But really, I, I love I love my goldfinches. So, of course, I love, um, you know, feeding with the socks. So Milo is sometimes confused with millet. Um, the white millet and the red millet are real millets and they're they're the higher quality um, seed um, compared to Milo. Milo is like, like I said, it's sorghum. And uh, it's just kind of cheap food. The, 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 the real weedy birds will eat it sometimes, but they don't eat enough to, to, you know, to make up for what's just left behind. You know, the Milo just really gets left behind or cast off. The birds are like, I don't want this. Um, the red millet, you can tell the difference because it's shinier and it's more consistently colored. Um, Milo is, you know, is, is not as consistently colored, kind of a dull looking um, seed. Um, and it comes in the cheap blends. That's, that's where you find that stuff. Um, <clears throat> and then of course, here's some other good ingredients. Peanuts are preferred by certain types of birds, um, cracked corn and safflower. These are all things that will totally show up. Um, sometimes uh, wheat is put in and that's a filler that nobody eats wheat seeds. So it's, it's thrown in there as a, as a filler. And this is what these you know, companies do um, again, Try to buy your bird seed from a seed company where they where they care. They where they're there for the birds and not there to, you know, also sell you pesticide. Um, there's a lot of that junk out there. Um, it also depends on where you buy your seed from too. Um, oh, somebody asked or sta said somebody stated that the yellow on on the feathers, on the the yellow on the feeder attracts bees and wasps. Have you heard this? I don't believe it. Um, Bees uh, are attracted to sugar water. That's what attracts them. And they're smart. They go inside Coke cans. They go, they, they will find that sugar water wherever they can get it. Now there are, um, there are these little plugs that you can plug into certain bee, uh, certain hummingbird feeders that, that um, they're guard, they call them bee guards, I think. And they 
um, will, um, the, the hummingbirds can get in there and still get the food, but the bees can't get in there as well. And that'll deter a lot of the bees. Honestly, I don't care. Um, the, bird, the hummingbirds are, are not deterred by the bees. They don't harm each other. Um, it's, it's the old uh, drinking, what do they call that? The, um, uh, where all the animals go and they, the, they drink together and some of them eat each other, like whatever. Um, although bees and, bees and hummingbirds are never enemies. But anyway, uh, don't, um, don't anthropomorphize animals. Um, they're fine with the bees. If they're annoying to you, that's a different thing. And then you might want to pick up the, the, the bee guards or pick up a hummingbird feeder that has bee guard attachments. Um, and because uh, if, you know, if, if it's right on your porch where you sit, maybe you don't want a lot of bees around. Um, I will say this, even, um, and I know a little bit about bees and I, bees that are, uh, you know, people are mostly afraid of the um, spicy bees. Um, I don't like calling them Africanized bees because they're not from Africa. They're they're developed, they're, they're hybrid developed by a white Portuguese guy in South America. So we should really call them Portuguese bees or white man's bees. But anyway, um, those bees that everyone's afraid of, the hive mentality is really dangerous, but the bee by itself flying around acts like every other bee and is usually not a threat. It's when you get near the hive that they get wonky. So. Um, you don't need to be afraid of bees. Um, and so, yeah. Um, anyway, uh, bee guards, um, if you want to deter the bees or don't worry about it, which is what I suggest. Um, fruit eating birds, some birds eat fruits. And this is one of the things you can find out on the, you know, oh, by the way, Tucson Audubon Society has all these types of things. Um, we're going to be carrying some more bird feeders soon too. We got hummingbird feeders, but we've we're going to carry some more uh, uh, seed and bird feeders and maybe we'll pick up these little hooks. I don't know. But uh, anyway, um, you know, a lot of us buy citrus or have citrus trees and we just can't eat them all. Um, here's a really great use for those. Um, put them up for uh, for birds. Mockingbirds really like these. Um, I, we, we, I stick the citrus actually on a, we have a, an agave and I stick the citrus on the points of the agave. So um, they get up on there and they eat the stuff. You can stick them on cactus too. You don't have to buy anything. You can stick them on a, on a pokey branch that's coming out of a tree, you know, a little stub or something. Um, you don't have, like, you don't always have to buy stuff. You can, you can actually leave these um, in the bird feeders too. So, um, but anyway, a lot of birds will, will take advantage of this. And again, give them some time. Sometimes they don't come right away. And then once they get into the habit and they know, oh, that if I go there, there's fruit over there, then you'll have your regular visitors. And then every once in a while, you'll have an Oriole. And then, wouldn't that be cool? Um, you can also do like apples, melons. Watermelon is really great. Um, grapes, jellies. Um, you know, you can smear jelly on a, on, a, on, a, on, a, um, on a bird feeder. You will get bees from that too. And the bees really like um, all the sweet stuff as well. So know that you're going to attract bees. You can also put raisins and currants and stuff like that in, in a bird seed and maybe in a platform feeder or something like that. And they'll find them. They'll find them in there. Because a lot of these birds, some of, some, of, some of the fruit eaters also eat seed or sometimes they just, somehow they find it, you know, like, the, like this little bird. In, uh, that bird is eaten out of a pomegranate, which by the way is a great, you know, have, have you ever had a pomegranate that, you know, it's not really tasty and not really good for humans, cut it in half, give it to the birds. Um, suet is a, a type of, uh, is a method of feeding birds that almost every bird loves. Like and I, most birds will take advantage of suet because what is suet? Suet's fat. It's, it's like lard, it's like kidney fat. Um, and they smush it together with seed and sometimes insects, sometimes grub worms. Um, and birds go nuts over this stuff. So, um, and, and a lot of birds do like, but there are birds that, that you can't attract with the other feeders and they'll go after this. So um, um, you can, and there's stuff on the internet. You look up uh, how to make my own suet and you'll find um, recipes where you can make your own suet blocks. So you don't have to go broke, um, you know, trying to, trying to feed your birds with all these suit blocks because they cost some money, you know, it's, it's, it's more expensive because there's fat in there. Fat's not cheap stuff. So 
Um, but the birds really love it. And particularly in the winter time is a really good time for them. But we live in a climate where, I don't know, uh, uh, fat is also important during the summertime in our climate too, because we're, you know, um, uh, for the, the opposite reason, you know, it's, it's hot out there. <laughs> um, birds need that nutrition, but there's a lot of protein in these things too. And another great thing to feed birds, peanut butter is great. They love it. And again, you'll get birds that you don't get otherwise. Um, this is a, a, a nice little um, easy way of doing it. Now, um, if you do peanut butter, mix it with cornmeal, you know, and I don't know, just, I don't measure, but just, you know, like mix it up and you want it to still be sticky or holds together. Um, they'll go nuts for it. Um, and, and, uh, you know, you'll get some cool birds. <clears throat> of course, how do you attract the aquatic birds? That's how you attract aquatic birds. Not everybody has this capability of, of installing something like this in your yard, or maybe you don't even want to, but, um, it is cool if you can do it. Um, you know, this is, and this is not a non-native thing. We, we, we had a lot more um, waterways in Arizona before um, colonialization really like ripped up this land. But, um, but uh, especially when people really started moving here and draining the water table. But, um, but uh, yeah, adding water is great. And that's great for all birds. All birds are gonna take advantage of this. But then if you have a little water feature like this, you can get, you can get some really cool birds showing up that will not show up anywhere else. I mean, I, I had a neighbor who had a tiny little pond and it wasn't natural like this either. It was just like this dumpy little thing with a little pump and, and uh, blue herons would come to his yard all the time. They check it out. They, you know, they might not hang out there very long, but, uh, but if you do give them, you know, something like this to go with, you know, this, this is for those of you who can afford to do this and also, are super into, um, this is a bit of work and you're gonna have to do some research on how to put together a, a water feature. You have to make it, you know, hold water for one and, and you do want it to circulate. Um, you, you could um, connect this to an aquaponics system too. But, uh, um, and then if you have fish in there, you know, then you're feeding the herons with the fish. Um, they'll come to the, your pond whether or not you have fish in there. Um, all right, we're gonna go through some plant profiles of plants that, that are some of our favorite plants for birds. Um, <clears throat> the basic trees in Arizona in, in the Tucson Basin are obviously gonna be great wildlife plants and particularly bird plants. Ironwood is one of the best trees that you can plant um, along with um, um, you know, the mesquite and the Palo Verde. Um, they provide shelter. Um, there's a lot of birds that do take advantage of seed on these trees, on the legumes. So we're talking about, you know, mesquite, Palo Verde, acacias, um, ironwood. Um, there's certain birds that eat their seed. Um, and then the insects that are in those canopies. And there's a lot going up there. You might not be up there to see it every day, but there's so much insect activity happening in these canopies. And a lot of birds... Um, are specific about what they like. And so they go at me. So you'll get certain different types of birds, especially if you really get into the little ones that everyone, you know, when you're first birding, you, you're going after the elegant trogon or you're going after like all these really big, sexy birds. Um, but then, you know, as you get into birding, you start to really fall in love with these little birds that everyone calls little gray birds, um, L, you know, LGBs or whatever. Um, but then you realize how important they are and how cool some of them are and how rare some of them are. And then you get to looking at them closer and they're like not boring little birds, but you just weren't paying attention. Um, and uh, so those little birds, man, a lot of them show up in these trees. So ironwood, velvet mesquite, Palo Verde. Um, Desert willow uh, also attracts hummingbirds because it's a nectar plant. So, um, and, and oh, by the way, uh, you, so a lot of these trees, they, th th these are all nectar plants, right? Ironwood, velvet mesquite, Palo Verde. Um, they're not the kind of nectar plants that hummingbirds are necessarily going after or preferring, but they're uh, nectar plants that a lot of insects are going after. And that's one of the reasons that they show up. It's not always the reason that certain insects show up, but um, anything that blooms like this, of course, is gonna have a lot of food for birds. Um, but the desert willow it does have that, you know, it added attraction that the hummingbirds really do love this, this plant. Um, 
And uh, we talked about the acacias too. This cat claw acacia in particular, I think is a really good one. I have, I've seen a lot of, a lot of insects and birds show up at a cat claw that I have not seen on other plants. And, and uh, the, I don't know why. Um, it is thorny. <laughs> uh, I get mad at this plant all the time when I'm in the nursery or like at my house and I'm tr you know, trying to get around my plants and they're, and trying to plant something in that cat caucasia grabs you and you get really mad. Um, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's worth growing. It's a really great plant. Um, um, so by the way, someone's asking about, can you suggest any fast growing bushes, trees that are in an area that won't get a lot of natural water? Um, first of all, when you start off a plant, you're going to have to water it. Um, that's just the way it is. And fast growing plus low water is not a thing. Um, you know, uh, ironwoods people think are slow growing because when they plant them, they put them out in the landscape and, uh, and they, they maybe water it a little bit, but then it's off on its own. And, uh, and it'll sit there and do nothing because they don't have enough resources. Remember the plants that are growing, um, they're, they, they need energy. And so they don't just need food, they need organic material in the soil as well. So um, there's no magic bullet for that answer. There's, you know, if you're, you, you, I would either suggest um, that you go out to uh, find a way to water that plant. Um, you know, some people get like a five gallon jug and poke a small hole in it so that it slowly waters the plant and they take that jug out there. You do something like that. I don't know, but you got to water if you want a plant to be fast growing or to grow at all, really. Um, but obviously most of our native plants can grow in rainfall, but just if you go out in the nature and you see what they look like right now, they don't look good and they're not growing fast. And our fastest growing plants are the riparian ones, the mesquite, the blue Palo Verde. Um, if you look at the foothills Palo Verde, it's usually slow growing because it's usually in the foothills. Now, if you water a foothills Palo Verde a lot, it'll grow fast, but, um, but they tend to be slow in nature because they are growing in very dry areas. Um, someone asked, is the sweet acacia at all native? It's technically not native. It's a Mexican species, um, but it's one of those species that, um, uh, there's a whole host of plants that are uh, that are um, pioneer plants. They're not plants that um, have a niche in our developed ecosystems, right? So if you look at a saguaro forest, not not one that's been ruined, but like you go to a saguaro forest that's intact, you're not going to see a lot of you're not going to see sweet acacia or the Mexican Palo Verde because those plants are um, weedy plants and they, um, they're found in like waste, uh, the land that's been grazed or overgrazed or land has been disturbed in general. Um, are they native here? Not really, but, uh, but they're not really native anywhere. They're not, they're, their role is to be a pioneer plant. Now they are native in Mexico mostly, um, and, uh, and, you know, they came here when more traffic was coming between here and Mexico. So, um, so you know, as, as more trade was happening um, between um, the North and the South, that brought a lot of movement of seeds and stuff. And that's long before white people got here, by the way. So, um, so they, they came up here, you know, but they were in disturbed soil spots. So that's the sweet acacia. Um, is also not long lived. Um, it's, it's a nice plant. Um, it, show, it showed up in our yard and we let it just grow. Um, it, it volunteered itself um, when we first moved in. And now they're like full grown trees. It's really fast growing. But the thing to know about sweet acacias is they're not long lived. So sweet acacia is um, Vachelia uh, farnsiana, or it used to be acacia farnsiana, it doesn't matter what you call it. Um, but it's a, it's a more arborescent, meaning tree-like acacia. Our native acacias are shrubbier. So the white thorn acacia and the cat claw acacia. And there's others too. There's little, you know, there's the um, um, Santa Rita acacia and, and all those. But we won't go down that, that, that deep hole. Um, hackberries, particularly, of course, the um, desert hackberry. The fruits are really sweet for humans and for 
for um, the fruit eating birds. So it's a great, great wildlife plant. It's also a larval host for like four, four or five butterfly species that at least that I know of and moths too. So it's a really good wildlife plant in general, um, but it's a really great bird plant. It's also pokey, as we said. Um, and so it will um, be a very good uh, habitat for birds. Um, we have a friend that lives out in the west side of town here and we go to her house every once in a while and her whole property is surrounded by um, native desert hackberry. It's just native there. And it's, there's always birds there. They're always going nuts. It's really great. <clears throat> Somebody asked about cassia. Cassia is an Australian plant. Um, it's the old name for senna's. And I think you're talking about those ones that are blooming now. The, they look like big popcorn balls everywhere in town. Um, I'm not a big fan of those plants. Uh, the honeybees, which are not native, um, use it, but not a lot of native ins uh, insects use it. And birds, I don't really see birds on there that much. Um, and it's a easy to grow plant. Um, it, I don't think it's become a serious weed problem. Um, although I have seen it volunteer in urban areas, but I haven't seen it show up in the, the wild yet. But it's Australian, so um, it evolved there. And there's probably birds and insects that were very closely related to that plant. Here, not so much. Um, anyway, oh, by the way, we do have our own native cassia, Senna. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a little, well, there's a few species and they're, um, they're not those big popcorn ball plants, but we have our own species. Um, anyway, let's, let's move on. Uh, Mexican elderberry, another really good uh, bird plant because of the fruit. Um, it also has nectar rich flowers that attract a lot of insects. So you get a lot of canopy gleaners. Um, and uh, obviously, uh, you know, it's, it's naturally, this is a shrub. If you grow Mexican elderberry and no, we don't have any right now. Um, um, the uh, it, fruit trees have been really hard to keep up with this year, um, particularly native ones, but we are growing them and we're trying to get them to you. Uh, it takes some time. If you grow one of these, grow it as a big shrub. Don't, don't prune it into a tree. Um, it's a really great giant shrub. It'll eventually become a tree on its own um, in, in many years. By the way, this is a, a summer deciduous plant in the low desert. It's green in the winter time. And then uh, in June, it looks like it's dying. It's just going dormant. Um, anyway, it gets those blue fruits that are also good for people. It's best to turn them into preserves. I don't think they're really good raw. I think they're actually not quite edible when they're raw. Um, I don't think they'll harm you that much, but you want to make them into preserves and then they're fantastic. And of course you can make um, elderberry, elderberry flower products as well. There's elderberry flower liqueurs and teas and stuff like that. But anyway, um, for the birds, it's an, a fantastic plant. This is, this is a plant that has a lot of activity going on. Um, somebody said, I'm actually thinking, what I was actually thinking of is winter senna. I don't know what you mean by that. Um, um, if, uh, you, you, if, if, if you can text me a picture or something, I, but I, I don't know what winter senna, winter senna means. There's a lot of common names that people use it that aren't right or real. Um, and there's also like people use many common d names for one plant and it's really confusing. So um, if you can get a botanical name, that's what is always best if you're trying to ask about a particular plant. Um, wolfberry is we have at the nursery right now, I think we have four or five species. Um, wolfberry is an excellent na uh, native um, uh, bird shrub, obviously for the fruits, um, also because of insects, because of the nectar rich flowers, also because it's a great um, shelter because it's a spinescent uh, rambling big shrub. So, um, and so uh, it's a, uh, a, an excellent wildlife plant. This is also, by the way, a summer dormant shrub. Uh, so it'll look kind of yellow in June. Don't think there's anything wrong with it. It'll look like it's sick. Um, the leaves will be mottled sometimes, even a little diseased looking, um, and they drop. Um, but, um, and sometimes they'll be entirely dropped. Sometimes they don't drop leaves at all. But, but if, if this looks rugged in, the, in June, don't worry about it, it'll come back. <clears throat> um, giant sacaton. Um, by the way, grasses in general, 
plant grasses. Obviously birds use grasses in their nest building. Um, I don't know, Senna, Senna bicapularis? Do you mean Senna, by, there's biflora? Um, I don't know, uh, let me look that up later. Um, anyway, grasses, uh, a, lot, a lot of birds use um, grasses. And then there's a lot of grasses that have larger seed. The Sacaton has a larger seed. Um, there's a uh, vine mesquite, Hopi obtusa has a larger seed. Of course, the seed is, is very attractive to birds. And, and, um, and, and Sacaton is also a big plant too. So it's a habitat plant, um, meaning that um, there's a lot of things happening around that plant. So habitat plant doesn't always mean the birds hang out there and get protection. Sometimes it means that it creates a habitat where there's insects. And, and, um, and so birds that are ground gleaners will hang out. Our Abert's toe hangs around the, the giant sacaton all the time because it creates a little habitat. So, um, so giant sacaton, an excellent one. Obviously we've talked about the Arizona cotton top already. Um, it's sort of an obvious nest um, material. And of course the seeds are bigger. Um, <clears throat> so quail bush, we've talked about this already too, um, but an incredible, um, there's several species of Atroplex, by the way. Um, this in the picture is Atroplex lentiformis and lentiformis is a very big shrub. If you go to the, um, uh, the water treatment facility in town where, you know, a lot of people go birding, um, it's covered in this plant. This plant is everywhere and it just, and I don't know how many they originally started with, but like there's just field, there's like fields of solid quail bush there and it's just full of birds, of course. So a great plant if you have the room. Um, someone texted me about this plant um, asking me if this was a great bird plant. It definitely is. Um, it's got edible fruit for people as well, um, but birds is where I, where, what I may mean at when I plant this. Um, those leaves are very prickly and, you know, not fun to work with when you're trying to do something to the shrub, but, uh, but it's, um, for that very reason, is an incredible wildlife plant. Um, Petey Mosquito has a whole bunch of these at his house, and it's always full of little birds. Um, in fact, when I'm kind of hunting for, you know, those little, those little shy birds, I, I sometimes will hang out around this plant with my binoculars and wait for something cool to show up. Um, he's got some really nice specimens of this plant. Um, but an excellent, excellent wildlife plant. Uh, Zisiphus obtusifolia, gray thorn, uh, again, fruits, insects, shelter. So you're seeing the patterns here, right? Um, Chuparosa, um, I, I did put a few hummingbird plants in here. I know you guys are smart enough to know hummingbird plants. So like I didn't like load up my list full of hummingbird plants because you know pensamins attract hummingbirds, you already know that. Um, but I will say this about the chuparosa. Um, the chuparosa is so, it's very nectar rich and, and it's not just uh, uh, hummingbirds, you know, a lot of, of, of animals um, love this plant, but uh, this plant actually does um, drive, the, the hummingbirds love this species so much and it shows up in very dry areas um, it actually drives a migration of certain hummingbird species into particular areas. They follow this plant because it's dependable and it's a really good nectar source. Um, and so definitely a very good hummingbird plant. Um, and also, you know, the ground gleaning insect birds and, um, and you know, provide shelter to hang out in and hide. Um, fairy duster, another hummingbird plant, another insect greening, gleaning plant. And also I think it's the quail, I think quail take advantage of the seeds on this plant too. So um, it's a legume and the seeds uh, are eaten by certain types of birds. Um, everyone should have a fairy duster, like especially the pink one, because um, it's like just a must have two sewn in. If you're, if you're a real two sewn in, you got a fairy duster. Um, I don't know why I said that, but I, I believe it though. Um, desert broom, yes, the plant that everyone loves to hate. Um, the plant that we definitely love. Um, yes, it's native, don't tell me it's not. Some people are like, that's not native. It is native, but it is a plant that um, is kind of weedy. 
and it, it loves disturbed sites and it's native to riparian areas. It is one of the most nectar rich plants that you can find. And because of that, it attracts all kinds of insects and thus all kinds of birds. Um, so, um, and as we talked about that, it also provides nesting material, especially the females. These are dioecious, meaning there's males and females. Um, at the nursery, we don't see, we don't sell a female. Um, I'm not really morally opposed to it, but I think people might show up with pitchforks if we sold, <laughs> sold yellow, um, and sold the female uh, plant. But, uh, but you know, it's, it's a great plant. And really, like, if you just get on top of those um, seedlings, you know, soon enough, um, they're easy to get to pull up. But if you just miss it for too long, then yeah, you're going to have a, a big old shrub. Um, <clears throat> ah, I love what you just said. Someone said, if you're a real Tucson and you have desert broom, mm, that's great. I, I love you guys. We have the best audience. Um, it's really great. I, I usually don't have to argue. I'm so prepared for it, but I don't have to argue. Um, so anyway, desert brooms are great. Um, they, they attract insects that no other plants attract. Um, entomologists that I hang out with, they look for this plant in the field because it's full of insects that don't show up on any, anywhere else. It's super nectar rich. Um, and so, yeah, the, the birds that eat those insects will show up on this plant. Everyone shows up on it. It's just like, um, it's just like the New York City of plants. I don't know. I don't know if that works, but anyway, you, you get what I'm saying. Um, sunflowers. And when I say sunflowers, I'm talking about um, species of helianthus. There's the, the, the annual one the, that either is the wild annual sunflower that just has a little tiny flower, or you can get the, the you know, the overbred uh, sunflowers that we grow in our gardens. And that, those are great plants for birds. Um, but there's others, you know, the, this picture is actually a species um, that's, that's perennial, Helianthus maximiliani, and uh, it spreads by underground tubers. Um, you could grow the sunchoke. The sunchoke is not really native to our area, but it's a great garden plant. You can grow them for the roots that people eat, but, uh, but it's a sunflower. And so it does the same thing. The flowers are nectar rich, which attract all kinds of insects, which attract insectivorous birds. But then when they go to seed, you get the birds that hang out and eat the seed. So um, there's also Tythonia, which is the tree sunflower. Um, and uh, and if um, that's a that's also same same um, benefits, except that they are more perennial and they get arborescent, you know, um, tree like. So um, there's there's a couple species of Tythonia that are tree like. Um, this one that we really want to introduce, I have to grow it out, but I've got them in my yard and I'm collecting seed of it. And it looks it's not it's it's greener than the than the Mexican tree sunflower that you usually see in town. And I think it, it's held up to the cold a lot better in our yard too. They both get kind of nipped, you know, but um, it's a cool plant. So we'll, it's, it's uh, I think Tythonia fruticosa. Um, so it's, it's, it's already taller than the house. Like it's giant. Um, anyway, those are all good. Um, bee brush, the, um, this is also a very good butterfly plant and that's what it's usually um, talked about, um, but uh, the seeds are, this plant is covered in goldfinches when it's going to seed. The, for some reason, the goldfinches just really love this plant. Um, it becomes a very sprawly kind of, uh, this is not one of your neat shrubs. And uh, this is not a dodan, this is not a hot bush, um, or, you know, this, that's, a, it's not a nice neat shrub. It's like, ah, it throws branches all over the place. Um, um, and for that reason, a lot of birds hang out in it, um, but also because it, it's shelter and food and insects, which, you know, you're getting it. Milkweeds, um, because of the insects it attracts, but also the floof that it makes. It makes floof and floof is always used for nest building. Um, so, um, you know, any of the milkweeds, they, all the milkweeds make floof and, um, and the birds find it and they use it. Um, and milkweeds are cool for a whole lot of other reasons. We talked about milk, milk thistle. Now be careful, there are some Circium species out there that are very noxious weeds, um, and they're usually found in agriculture areas. So if you're trying to grow your own milk thistle, know which are the native species. Um, 
Oh, somebody asked, uh, I'm going to back up to this. Um, somebody asked, can Aloysia gratissima, which is this plant, grow in part sun? Yes, it can. And in fact, I think I most often see it in part sun. So yeah, it'll be just fine in full, in, in full to part sun. I've even seen them in shady areas and they don't look as good, but, but they grow there. But part sun is, is, is sufficient. Um, anyway, back to the cerium. Um, try to find Neo Mexicana or Arizonica. Arizonica is that red one, uh, smaller flower, but red flowers and hummingbirds go after that one. Hummingbirds actually go after this one too. It's a really good nectar plant. And I didn't write that on there, but it's a good nectar plant. Um, this also produces seeds that a lot of birds will use. And, um, and we've talked about how it is uh, floofy. So um, floof produce, it produces material for nests. Desert marigold. A lot of people don't think about this as a bird plant, but it really is. Um, and it's for the seed. The, the, a lot of birds really like desert marigold seed. And, uh, and also uh, when it says shelter there, it means that there, there's a lot of ground, uh, ground birds that hang out around desert marigolds, partly because it has the food, but they like hanging out around it. Um, probably because they're maybe also eating some of the insects that hang out around it. Um, and this is one of those, I think, OG Tucson plants too, like Tucsonan has a desert marigold. I don't know why, but it, I just have always felt that way. Um, desert honeysuckle. Now, any of the honey, any of the Anisacantha species are great. This one is our, our Tucson Basin native though, and I really love this plant. Once in a blue moon, it'll throw out, I mean, it'll throw out some seed that where you get a yellow flowering one, but most of the time it's orange or kind of a brick colored, um, almost sometimes almost brown. The colors vary in the flowers. Um, and uh, this one in, in a lot of gardens, it's best in part sun. Once they're established, they can totally take full sun. And in full sun, they'll need more water. Um, if you drive to the Desert Museum and you, know, you see this plant all along the roadsides and it's growing in full sun. And some of, sometimes it's reflected heat off the off the road, but uh, but it's also getting a lot more water, right? Because the, the water washes off the road and goes to those roadsides. Roadsides always have a lot more interesting plants because of that. There's there's more water available. Um, the seeds are also eaten by birds too. If they can get them in time, uh, these things spit their seeds out. Um, and of course, they attract insects, um, which you know birds like. Prickly pear, of course, you got to have a prickly pear. Um, and especially Anglemanii, which is what this, this species is. Um, Engelman, it, it, that's our native, th the most common of our native prickly pears and, and the best fruit for humans. Um, uh, but also the birds go nuts over this plant. And this, this plant attracts a ton of insects that the birds that eat insects go after as well. And then of course uh, it's habitat because it's a spiny, spiny thing that birds can hide out in. So prickly pears, um, everyone should have a prickly pear. Choya, everyone should have a choya too. Um, <clears throat> choyas are uh, obviously um, great habitat plants. And, uh, and you know, the cactus wren, they love building nests in choya. Um, of course, they attract uh, certain types of insects too that insect eating birds also like. And of course, the saguaro. Um, obviously, uh, it's a nectar plant, it's an insect plant, it's a uh, it's a shelter plant too, because uh, when they get big anyway, they, uh, they provide um, a safe place for birds to nest and hide and, uh, or get, a, get away from trouble on. So, um, so of course, the worlds are really great bird plants. And so that is my last um, slide. And there's always a, um, a pause, you know, because the, the way that these live streams work, I don't know how many minutes it, it is ahead, but, um, but this is your time to ask questions. And um, you can, it doesn't have to be about bird gardening. You can ask other questions too. Let me really quickly though, look up by Capularis because um, I'm curious as to what that is referring to. Uh, um, all right. So, by Capsularis. Oh, that's a South American species. Okay. Um, so I will say this about, I, I know, I remember this plant. Um, I would rather personally plant 
Senawis lizani, which this looks a lot alike, except this is a little more gaudy and tropical. Um, and um, and uh, I will say this about South American species, at least it's on the same, because uh, North America and South America are separate continents, right? So it's not the same continent, but, but there's some shared species. And so I think a lot of our species are more likely to recognize this plant than they are um, the Australian senna's. So, um, so you know, I'm gonna I would push you towards um, one of the other senna's. Um, but uh, yeah, so um, here's a picture for people who don't know what we're talking about. Uh, this is we have a we have a couple species. Uh, is this gonna work? Never mind. <laughs> That's not going to work. Um, so, uh, actually, another one too, Senna herda, or um, what was it? It was used to be called Senna lepticollis. That one's another native one that's a big, shrubby um, plant, just like this. Um, it goes dormant in the wintertime, and you cut it back, and then it grows again. Um, they're um, larval food plants for several butterflies. Um, and, um, and then of course the native bees really like our native senna's. Um, this senna doesn't look as, um, as foreign as the Australian one. So I'd say this is, you know, if you end up with this plant, it wouldn't be the end of the world. It's probably a nice plant. I don't think it's a problem as far as weediness. I think I would have already heard about it. Um, I feel like I have come across this plant before, but you know, I'm, I'm sort of a snob about <laughs> yeah, that's not native. Um, anyway, uh, I would prefer Senna herta or Senna covesii or Senna wislizani. Covesii is a little guy that's, is, you know, that little one that's growing all over the Tucson mountains. Herta is tall and big though, and so is wislizani. Wislizani is a deciduous shrubby plant, um, but looks a lot like this one does in the summertime, especially when it's getting lots of water. So, um, so anyway, um, somebody said, which tree is the best for birds to plant in foothill caliche soil? <clears throat> Any of the foothill species. Um, so if you're in that uh, foothill soil, the, the species that naturally grow there are the foothills palaverde, which is not as big as the blue palaverde, but um, actually is very interesting. It attracts birds that the blue palaverde do, do, do not attract. So I love that plant. And you know what else? The foothill palaverde, the trunk stays green. Um, the blue palaverde gets much bigger, but, it, um, but it's, its trunk eventually turns brown. Um, and if you water a foothill palaverde well, it actually grows pretty fast. I would also do ironwood. Um, or any of the acacias um, are fine. The foothill, I mean, the um, uh, white thorn or cat claw acacia would be good. Um, so all those would be great. Um, and, and really even the mesquites and palaverdes, they'd find their way through that soil just fine. So if you really wanted to do one of those, you could. Um, our, our trees are pretty tough. They can handle the caliche and stuff like that. I will say with the ironwood, if the caliche is actually preventing soil from draining and it stays really wet and swampy um, because it doesn't drain, like there's a water source like irrigation and it's, and it's watering, but the, the water doesn't drain, um, it gets anaerobic and, and ironwoods don't love that. So um, I'd say that, you know, make sure that the soil is draining well, but in nature, ironwoods are around caliche and they do just fine. Um, benefits of the roly poly beetles. Um, yeah, uh, so the, the um, pill bugs or potato bugs or roly polies, um, are, they're, I don't think they're native, um, but they're here and um, they're not a problem at all. They're actually food for a lot of things. So they have a lot of benefits. Actually, roly polies are really cool. Um, they decompose um, organic material. That's a, an incredible thing that they do. They provide foods for ground gleaning birds because they will eat them. Um, 
and they um, and because of their decomposing of um, organic material, they're very good for biology in the soil. So your microbes are really happy when they're when those roly polies are around. And I don't know, you know, they they talk about them being able to handle uh, heavy metals. Um, I don't. I wouldn't put too much credence in that. Like heavy metals are always going to be around no matter what. Um, sometimes they can get locked up in certain types of humic substances. I think it's the only way that you can really lock them up. Um, the roly polies can eat them, but then the heavy metals are in the roly poly, and I, I think you, you still have the heavy metal around. So, um, so it, you try not to get heavy metals in your soil. Um, so someone said cat claw, acacia, or ironwood. Oh, I love those trees. I love both those trees. Um, I, I assume you're asking me um, which one would I choose. Um, I love, so I, I hate and love them both actually. Um, it, I, I, I'm, I'm so glad people aren't around me all the time when I'm watering or I'm, I'm moving things around because I yell at inanimate objects like an old man. Um, I, you know, if you've ever struggled with hoses, long hoses around a nursery or if you're in your own yard and you're like, why did you kink there? Why did you do that? I don't, I yell at things like that. And I yell at cat clocacia and ironwood. They're both really grabby and like you pick them up and you're trying to move them and they grab your clothes and they grab other plants and I'm like, you son of a bitch, you know, <laughs> um, but uh, that doesn't deter my love for them as a plant in the landscape. They are incredible plants and, um, and they both have um, their own hosts of wildlife. If you're gonna choose between the two, choose because of form, because ironwood is a tree and is, is definitely a tree. Um, Cacalacacia is naturally a shrub and then eventually becomes a tree. Um, a small tree. Um, it only gets, you know, offhand 15, 20 feet. And I've seen them bigger than that. They, they could definitely get a little bit bigger than that, but that's kind of rare. They're usually, you know, usually 10 feet tall, 15 feet tall, eventually. And um, they're just really good screens. They're really good shrubs, um, especially if you're trying to keep people out. <laughs> uh, they're good at that because they're just grabby. Um, the only time I've seen the purple hair streak in my yard, the purple hair streak, the beautiful butterfly, um, I see him because uh, they hang out in the canopies, right? Where the mistletoe is laying their eggs on mistletoe. Um, and they don't, they, that, they're up there all the time. And I think they probably get their nectar on, 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 you know, maybe tree flowers and stuff. I'm not sure. But the, the time I have seen them in my yard has been on the cat claw acacia. And, um, and it's always stunning when you see them because they're just gorgeous. They're just like, what is that? You know, and it's hair streak. Hair streaks are usually small. Um, but the purple hair streak is, is a majestic and large for a hair streak, but just a beautiful colored black and purple and blues in there. Oh, it's a gorgeous thing. Um, okay. Um, let's see. Someone asked, I've been... I'm, I've been digging garden beds four feet deep and I've been running into roots from my mesquite tree. How do you recommend managing the roots while digging? Uh, to be honest, like, I don't really worry too much about it. Um, um, you can think of it as root pruning almost. Um, although you're not, so every time you snip a root, it's gonna branch somewhere. And so um, people are always kind of worried about that. Now, if you're doing that all around the mesquite and you're pruning all of its roots like that, and you know what, even then it would probably be just fine, but maybe not do that. Um, but if, it, if, you know, if, it, if it's a tree that's nearby and there's some roots that go through your garden, um, yeah, I usually kind of try to cut them out and they're gonna come back. Um, one of the things about gardening, vegetable gardening is, is, you know, in a bed, eventually, if you have trees around close by, eventually that bed's going to be very difficult to uh, garden in because the roots from nearby mesquites and stuff are definitely going to get in there. Um, and maybe at that point, that's when you decide to go up. And that's when a lot, when a lot of people do. Um, but, um, you know, as far as the mesquite, it ain't going to hurt mesquite too much to snip some of those roots. Um, and uh, you're just root pruning. Um, and uh, they'll, they'll branch out and, and unfortunately keep coming back. Um, 
but uh, that's how it, that's what I do. And, um, you know, uh, it's just a, a fact of life when you have trees around. So, um, yeah, um, that's what also, by the way, another reason I know I've said this a lot to you guys, but like another reason not to worry about grub worms and not to think that grub worms are killing your trees um, or your plants. Uh, you know, they, um, they mostly eat detritus, but when they do eat the, in some of some species, when they do eat a little bit of root, they're only eating like smaller roots and they're not eating anywhere near enough to, to even make the tree flinch. So, um, so don't worry about grub worms. And, and I have them in my garden, by the way, and I don't dig them out. I don't, you know, sometimes I'll throw a couple at the chickens just cause I like to watch them chase it around and eat it. Um, but, uh, but they're not, uh, I've never had them take down a tomato plant or a pepper plant and there's lots of grub worms in my garden. So um, that's something that always freaks some people out. Uh, where to get mistletoe? I like the way you think. Is it okay to uh, take a little when you find it in nature? You, so <laughs> uh, I, uh, I've never done this, um, but I'll say this birds they eat the fruit and then they wipe their beaks um on the trees and that's how it gets established so if you want to get a mistletoe in your tree um i would pick the you know further out distal branches you don't want to do it too close to the trunk but you don't want to do it on the tip either you want to get in you know maybe somewhere in the middle and smear um sm i could just hear hoa is going nuts right now <laughs> and the and the guys who make a lot of money uh there's guys who make a lot of money trimming out mistletoe for people because they you know they tell them it's bad and, and uh, they make a lot of money on they're they're probably if they're watching this they would be screaming right now but um but yeah take the fruit you know fresh fruit and just smear it where you want it and um and uh you know try to get it from the species that you found it on although a lot of those mistletoe species like you know the one that grows on uh, acacias or on a mesquite that's all the same species but then there, there are other species too but um but if you want to ensure that it's going to work you know pick the same species that's the best way to do it. you can't really transplant them they're already in the tree when they're already growing so you want to grab the fruit um somebody asks when transplanting a barrel cactus or small saguaro, should I wait a few days between, in between uh, to sulfur the roots to prevent in infection? Really, all you, all you really have to do is just let it dry out. And don't let it dry for too long, but let it dry out and callus a little bit. Um, sulfur is an extra preventative measure that you can add, and dusting a little sulfur isn't too... Um, the only time I worry about sulfur is uh, too much sulfur in the soil can be harmful to some of those microbes. A little sulfur is actually good, but too much sulfur can be damaging to some of your microbes. But on the on the base of a bare root uh, cactus, it's not going to cause any harm and it'll uh, it'll definitely um, keep your your cactus from rotting. Um, but you don't necessarily have to use sulfur. You can just um, uh, let it dry out a little bit. Um, Katie, somebody asked, uh, I love this question. It's like my favorite question I've had so far. They asked, how do you, how do you get mistletoe? <laughs> how do you introduce it? Eat it and shit on a tree. <laughs> Katie says, eat it and shit on a tree. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, um, I'll wait another minute or so. I'm going to have a couple sips of my canned rosé. I don't know if you were here earlier, but I'm drinking rosé from those cabezas. It's pink wine, 2019 carbonated. Um, it's, it's carbonated uh, rosé. And um, it's from Dos Cabezas from Sonoida, and it's delicious. Um, and uh, I love that these younger um, winemakers are doing things like putting wine in cans. It's so like, you know, um, we do not do that in France. No, you can't do that. Um, but it's okay. It's good. It's really good. Um, yeah. So yeah, if, if you guys don't have any other questions, um, I'll, I'll wait a second here and drink some wine. But if you don't have any other questions, um, we can end this soon. 
and uh, I can get ready for tomorrow because tomorrow's going to be, it's been busy. You guys have been buying a lot of plants and we're busy. <clears throat> we have to get up really early in the morning. Um, by the way, we got onion sets in now, little green onions. You plant them now by June, they will be, um, you know, onions that you eat. Um, we got a lot of them and they're, it's kind of like, think of them as like bare root things when you get bare root, but it's a green onion. You get them in bunches and you plant them and they're really easy to stick around, um, um, other plants. They're, you know, good mates with other plants. Don't, don't grow onions with, uh, um, legumes. So just keep them away from your sweet peas and stuff. Cause that, the extra nitrogen, you know, will cause lots of green growth, but maybe not a lot of bulbing. Um, but they, they're, they pair up well with almost anything else. Um, oh yeah, someone asked, where can you purchase the wine? Um, yes, it's, it's, it's available in a lot of places. I know it's at Westbound and Tap and Bottle because that's where we get it. Um, it's probably at Plaza too and probably at Rum Runner, but I know it's at um, Westbound and Tap and Bottle. So, um, so that's where that's, this can be purchased there today locally. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so if that's it, let me check the text. Yeah. So you guys are good. Thanks for joining us this week. And, um, next week is going to be about native plant care, which is like care throughout the year. Um, we'll talk about pruning and feeding and, and, you know, what kind of care should you do for native plants? We've talked a lot about care for garden, you know, herbs and vegetables and fruit trees, but, uh, but a lot of people ask questions about what, you know, how they can take care of their native shrubs and trees and ground covers and, and uh, what things you should look at, through, look at throughout the year. So that's something we'll talk about. And, uh, and I've, as always, like, even though if you're pretty knowledgeable about plants and you've been growing them for a while, we always try to have enough depth to every class where even if you're, um, you know, even if you're um, not green you know, in terms of being a desert dweller that you'll get something out of the class. Um, and so that's, and then the class after that is gonna be the palm class and then we'll probably take a little break from classes. Um, so yeah, um, at some point we're going to do more videos as opposed to live classes because they're um, easier to make, well, at, at least in terms of timing. <clears throat> um, and this is Ansel. Ooh, he's coming to say hi. Just in time, buddy. He's a big boy. He's a big moody boy. I got him from the, um, oh man, I get all the uh, cat. We, we, anyway, he got him as, we got him as a, uh, it's called Lease for Life. He was, uh, he had a, a colon problem and uh, they weren't sure how long he was going to live. He had, to, he had to have some of his colon removed and then he, had, he got medication. And um, uh, now he's like the healthiest cat we've ever had. So look how beautiful he is. Big meaty boy. Um, CJ, uh, the street access is just fine right now. Um, there's actually as many places to get in as there is in a normal time. It's just that there's tractors everywhere. But, um, and you have to drive over dirt, but we're pretty accessible right now. So um, hasn't really disrupted our business, um, except when we get, you know, deliveries or something that sometimes it can be pretty uh, um, annoying. Anyway, thanks guys. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Love you. I love the questions. I love that someone asked about where to get mistletoe. And I love that someone said that you're a real, real Tucson in if you plant 